Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Forum webinar series. I'm Leslie Kanan, Senior Field Officer with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In case you don't know, Preservation Leadership Forum is the professional membership program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This webinar series is made possible by members of Preservation Leadership Forum, and we sincerely thank those of you who are with us today. Today's webinar is titled, The Untold Story of Leona Tate, Gail Etienne, and Tessie Prevost on the front line of school desegregation in New Orleans. We are excited to have these three women join us today. Before we begin, here are a few technical logistics. We will take questions from the audience during the webinar. Please send questions via the Q&A function directly to panelists. You are welcome to submit answers and questions. You are encouraged, I'm sorry, you are Welcome to submit answers at any point during the webinar, but we will be waiting until the Q&A section to answer questions. You are also encouraged to communicate to all participants through the chat function. The closed captioning function is, is enabled for this webinar. You can enable it and disable it either through the controls at the bottom of the Zoom screen or through your audio settings, depending on what version of Zoom you are using. Following the program, we will send out recordings of today's webinar directly to the email you use to register. All forum webinars are archived in our forum library. Lastly, we will peri periodically drop links in the chat associated with the presentation and the presenters for more information. Last year, we commem commemorated the 67th anniversary by looking at the cases that occurred before Brown v. Board of Education. That webinar featured descendants from the Dred Scott v. Sanford case and the Plessy v. Ferguson case. T tonight marks the 68th anniversary of the Brown v. Board of Education decision. Through the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, we are commemorating this anniversary by collaborating with the Brown Foundation for Education, Equity, Excellence, and Research and the Washburn School of Law to hear from the McDonough Three, Leona Tate, Gail Etienne, and Tessie Prevost Williams, three, wo three women who in 1960, as girls, six years after the Brown decision, integrated McDonough 19 in New Orleans, Louisiana. We will hear their stories and learn about how the former McDonough 19 Elementary School became the Tate, Etienne, and Prevost Center. Before we get to their story, some of you may know that the National Trust has been playing a pivotal role in advocating for and advancing legislation related to Brown v. Board for over three years. I am incredibly excited to announce that last week on May 13th, President Biden signed into law the Brown v. Board of Education National Historic Park Expansion and Redesignation Act, creating multiple National Park Service designations that help share the full story of the landmark Brown v. Board of Education case which led to the end of separate but equal doctrine in public education and mandated the desegregation of public schools. The site included in this new law are located in Claymont, Delaware, Hocassin, Delaware, Wilmington, Delaware, Somerton, South Carolina, Farmville, Virginia, Virginia, the District of Columbia, and of course, Topeka, Kansas. This is an incredible way to commemorate this 68th anniversary of the Brown decision and to celebrate Preservation Month. Now, I would like to continue with a, with a video about the former McDonough 19 building itself, now known as the Tate, Etienne, and Prevost Center. The National Trust for Historic Preservation's African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund contributed a $75,000 grant donated by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in 2020 as well as funding from the capital from Capital One for the Trust Hulk Crew Preservation Trades Program, which completed work on four staircases inside the school in the spring of 2021. As a partner in the National Trust Where Women Made History campaign, Benjamin Moore and Company gave 700 gallons of paint for the building's interior. Now, here is the video. integration day today for the first grades of two New Orleans elementary schools. And under pressure of the federal court, 
My mother told me we was going to a new school, and then all of a sudden a black car pulled up in front of my door. And it was the U.S. Marshals. My mother told me before I left out the door, she said, when you get in the car, you sit to the back of the seat and don't put your face to the window. So we arrived and we came up the front stairs and we entered into this area and was asked to take a seat on a bench that was sitting on that wall right there. We sat there for hours. We played hopscotch on tiles of the floor because we were bored just sitting there, the three of us. Finally, they came to get us places in the classroom. Now, mind you, that was a full body of students when we got here. And once we entered the classroom, all their parents came and pulled all the white students out. So they left just the three of us in this entire building. And that lasted for a year and a half. The impact on November 14, 1960 was something that I don't think our families expected. It went national. It started a domino effect, really. Katrina was horrific, of course, to everyone. I think I stayed away two years. When we were allowed to come back into the Lower Ninth Ward after Katrina, they were, let's go ride by, let me see what the school looks like, you know. They had put a for sale sign on the building. They had no idea what had happened at the school. It was still standing. And I kept saying, something's got to be done in this night ward to energize this community. We got to do something down here. And I already was trying to see what was going to happen with this building. And I said, well, I can't let them tear it down. I felt like this is the energizer for this community right now. The first time I came in, it was, oh, Lord. It was horrific. And then when Benjamin Moore donated us all this paint, that was really special. I was just amazed, because I never thought it would look this good. I think I'm still walking in a dream sometimes. I just don't believe it's, it's done. And my vision has come to a reality, and it's done. When I first said I was going to do something with the building, I just wanted exhibits, you know. We were going to do it on each floor, but we had a housing need, especially in the Lower Ninth Ward. So we have 25 affordable units on the second and the third floor for 55 or older. Our first floor, the bottom level, will be an interpretive center, a place where people come in to do things, to learn about racism, to learn about the history that we had here, to learn about the civil rights. If you don't know the history, you're not going to know. You know. And I feel like that's what's so important about us doing what we're doing here. The next level is to undo racism. I want this to be the place for racial healing. Because I feel like even though we didn't understand what racism was, we were introduced to it here. And I want it to end here. Now, I would like to um, introduce Michael Grody. He's a registered architect, construction manager, and developer. He also considers himself an accidental preservationist and real estate developer. Mike has been with the Olympic Community Development in the New Orleans office since 2008. And in that time, he has led the design and construction of projects in both New Orleans and on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Mike has led the implementation of over 50 million in real estate developments for the New Orleans office. These complex historic and adaptive, adaptive reuse projects include the conversion of a former historic elementary school into a grocery store and office building, a former Catholic sanctuary into a theater company home with black box theater, two other stages and ancillary support spaces, and a former historic elementary school into a civil rights interpretive center and senior housing. His work on the ground has shaped his perspective on community development and design and the importance of community engagement and being useful 
to those in need. Mike has been an adjunct lecturer for Mississippi State University and Tulane University and holds an MS Building Construction Management with a minor, minor in Community Planning from Auburn University and a Bachelor's of Architecture from the University of Houston. Thanks, Leslie. I think we can start the slides. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Michael Grody, uh, and as, as Leslie introduced me, I'm, I'm a director at Olympic Community Development. Um, but I want to first thank uh, Cheryl Brown Henderson and the team at the Brown Foundation for inviting us, and especially inviting me to share the stage um, on such an important uh, event. Um, and uh, Leslie Cannon, Amy Webb, Priya Chaya, Ronison Cabbage, and everybody at the National Trust. Um, for uh, helping put this together, and, and our moderator Jay Hall. I just and I also want to thank everybody for coming um, tonight. Uh, it's it's really um, heartening to see that we have 91 participants um, on a on a Tuesday evening. Um, the next slide, please. Um, uh, Alembic is a community development uh, real estate developer. Um, I I like to say that we. Um, we are not the after-school special real estate developer that, that wants to tear down um, grandma's house and build some, um, some big shiny building. Um, we like to work with communities to be useful, to help them kind of execute their visions. Um, and we joint venture with uh, nonprofits and, and other community organizations to do that um, in, in both New York and New Orleans and, and places uh, further afoot. Um, next slide. Um, so, as you saw in this kind of really beautiful video that Benjamin Moore put together, um, Leona um, is, uh, is sort of standing in this building um, before, uh, this is probably five or six years ago, and, um, and Leona didn't sort of originally set out to accomplish what, what she did. Um, she wanted the school back open to being a school ran into a lot of dead ends there, then knew that something else had to happen and had to be, uh, uh, and I think eventually Leona came to the realization that it had to be her to do this. And, um, and I think now that we've gone through all of this, we know that she may have been the only one that could have done this. Um, and I think it turned out to be a lot more daunting than, um, uh, than anyone first thought, and I'm sure Leona ever first thought that um, to, to sort of do something with a building that was so important. Um, and like she said in the video, a lot of folks didn't even know um, how important this building was. Um, so, many, uh, so many folks knew a story about a famous Norman Rockwell painting, um, but only attached one girl of the four little girls who integrated schools that day to that painting. Um, and Leona had to talk to the school board, and I don't think anybody on the school board knew exactly uh, what happened uh, at McDonough 19. Um, once Leona had a vision, she started going to talk to banks and developers and all other, you know, building industry folks and um, did not find a lot of support um, until she met Benjamin Warnke, the founder and principal at Alembic Community Development, our, our boss. Um, and Benjamin said this could happen. Um, and then he introduced us to the to Leona to the New Orleans office. Um, next slide. Uh, we, we first met Leona in 2015 and um, I quickly Googled the story um, because I knew the painting, I knew who this was, and I was completely sort of shocked, honored, and also disappointed that I didn't know this story. Um, we also knew the mountains that needed to be moved and the mountains that needed to be climbed to accomplish um, uh, Leona's vision. Um, and, and so not only was this building kind of worse for wear after sitting vacant through almost 20 years, it sat through Katrina, Gustav, Isaac, and countless other uh, storms that have um, battered this city over the last um, 20 years. Um, next slide. But this building um, 
now looks like this, now looked like this, and you know, next slide. Um, that was the same entrance. And um, not only were the, did we have to figure out these, um, kind of how to fix this physically, and, and really the physical part of, of some of this work is pretty straightforward. It's, it's, it's actually, what are we gonna use the building for? Um, and also buildings um, like this and visions like this don't fit into tr traditional financing models. Um, we, you usually have two or three four sources in a real estate development deal. Um, this one had a few more. Uh, and this project uh, of over 40,000 square feet um, needed 16 million, a little more than $16 million to purchase and renovate. Uh, next slide. And in order to do that, we needed all of these funders. Um, and what I want everyone to kind of understand um, about this is that there are, I think, somewhere around 16 sources. And what's important is that what you have to do when you have all of these very different sources is you have to get all of these sources on board and aligned and all working towards the same vision, even though they have their own agendas and their own sort of goals. Um, it is a true testament, especially to my partner, Jonathan Light, to the work that he did to, along with Leona, um, to get all of these sources, all of these grants, all of these loans aligned to, to, to actually make this project happen. Um, next slide. Um, and in order to do that, we also had to show everybody we had a great project. Um, and so the partnership here is between the Leona Tate Foundation for Change and Alembic Community Development. We co-own the building together. LTFC, Leona Tate Foundation for Change is 50.1% owners and Alembic is 49.9% owners. And the People's Institute, who has been a partner from the beginning, um, is, is uh, a, a tenant in the building. Next slide. And a lot of the work we did together was to begin uh, to ob observe the uh, inequities in real estate development and in finance and show that we are aware of these things and we are trying to do a better job about how we redevelop. Um, and so we created a vision together. Next slide. And we created this preamble that is part of our operate, I mean, of our partnership agreement, that's part of our legal contracts to operate this building and this property. Um, and we put this at the front page of our, our agreement. It says that we will work together um, uh, and, and, and really be aware of, of how we work in, in a way that is not historically how real estate development has worked in neighborhoods like this. Uh, next slide. Um, we believe that equitable development is a, is a buzzword that gets thrown around a lot and that um, it's often defined by um, outcomes. Um, what we wanted to find, what we wanted to do was define it by process. And um, that meant we defined it by ownership. Equity first and foremost means ownership. And this building would not be in the hands of this partnership if it weren't for Leona Tate. And so having 50.1% ownership of this building was important to all of us. Um, but it also means a share in economics, profit and loss in the balance sheet. To have a, balance, have a property like this on the balance sheet of a nonprofit is meaningful, extremely meaningful. Uh, and also decision-making. And Leona would tell you, we've had a weekly meeting for several years, four plus years, maybe even five years, deciding on how this building, how this project would happen. Um, we believe that that is the process towards equitable, equitable development. Um, and, and we're really proud of, of, of the outcome that this process um, uh, created. Next slide. Um, this is a, a quick um, diagram. This is all sort of like hieroglyphics to most, but it shows how we created um, this project. 
um, and, and where the ownership is and where the money flows. Um, I just wanted to put that up there to show that like, this is really sort of how, how we did this. Um, next slide. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of rifle through some pictures here, but what I want folks to sort of understand is that um, I believe historic preservation um, is, is in for a reckoning. And uh, we often look at buildings and we sort of look at them and, and often historic preservation looks at buildings through a beauty standard or an aesthetic standard. We need to save these buildings because they're beautiful. Um, I believe that historic preservation is about the preservation of story. And I think this building has taught me that lesson. This building is on the national register and this building is being preserved not for its beauty, but for what happened here. And, <clears throat> and we have to understand how to separate those things. Um, because 2% of the 95,000 buildings on the National Register for Historic Preservation, or National Register of Historic Places, um, represents the Black experience in America, 2%. And if we begin to peel that back, the reason why we have this beauty standard, especially with buildings in the South, is because there are certain kind of folks who could pay for beautiful buildings. And there was a certain way that they raised, that raised um, or were able to afford that, um, including the person that this former school building was named after, John McDonough. John McDonough made his fortune off of the blacks, uh, off of the, the backs of enslaved humans. And <clears throat> he donated his money when he died to the children, the school children of New Orleans and Baltimore. And New Orleans built 40 schools and put his name on them. And that school, this particular school was, 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 was segregated, was all white from 1929 to 1960. And we have to understand that we shouldn't be saving buildings because they're beautiful, that we need to be saving buildings for their stories. And there are, obviously, if there's only 2% of 95,000 buildings on the register that represent Black stories, we have a long way to go. Um, next slide. And, the, and these are the slides from the ribbon cutting that happened May 4th, 2022, week, two weeks ago. Um, and this building is up and running. And um, we're very proud and excited to, to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, um, for that great presentation and those great images. Um, now I would like to introduce our moderator and our honored panelists who you are here to see. Um, first, our moderator, uh, Jay Hall. Jay Hall is a deputy director and general counsel for the Kansas Association of Counties. In his dual role as deputy director and general counsel, Jay implements the legislative policy for the association and its members through lobbying efforts, as well as offering legal counsel to the association, its executive board and employees, and its member counties. Jay received his Juris Doctorate from Washburn University School of Law. Jay was inducted into the Order of Barristers in 2007, and Jay lives in Topeka with his wife, Danielle, who is also a graduate of Washburn Law and a successful attorney. Next, we have our panelists. First is Leona Tate, who was born in 1954 and was chosen as one of the three little girls to break barriers in education on November 14, 1960 by desegregating McDonough 19, an all former, a former all-white elementary school in New Orleans. Like Gail Etienne and Tessie Prevost, she also integrated TJ Sims Elementary in third grade, then went on to desegregate Cone Junior High. When it was time for high school, Leona made history one more time when she, Gail, and Ruby Bridges integrated Francis T. Nichols High School. Leona spent her working career at Bell South Tele Telecommunications, AT&T, the U.S. Postal Service, and in the private sector. Leona Tate is the founder and executive director of the Le Leona Tate Foundation for Change Incorporated, which owns and operates the, the Tate, ETN, and Prevost, also known as TEP, Interpretive Center on site of the former McDonough 19. Next, we have Gail Etienne, um, also born in 1954 and also one of the three little girls. 
who desegregated McDonough 19. Gail um, has spent her working career at Bell South Telecommunications, Louisiana State University Medical Center, and the US Postal Service in New Orleans, and she currently resides in <coughs> Tulsa, Oklahoma. <coughs> Tessie Prevost is also one of the three little girls. And like um, Gail and Leona, um, left McDonough 19 to desegregate TJ Sims Elementary, where she attended until sixth grade. After sixth grade, Tessie and her parents agreed that she would no longer participate in the desegregation process. Tessie graduated from Joseph S. Clark High School. After 25 years of service, Tessie retired from LSU Dental School after 20 plus years of service as an administrative assistant in the Department of Pediatric Dentistry. Tessie currently resides in Laplace, Louisiana. And now I'll turn it over to Jay. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you. Thank you to our to our three esteemed guests. Is um, actually looking at the um, Tate Etienne Prevost Center. Um, what kind of change are you hoping to achieve with the programs that you have at the Tate Etienne Prevost Center? I really hope to change the energy of this community first. Um, since Katrina, we have just been devastated with with nothing you know, um, not even a, a decent supermarket. Hopefully, um, my next hope is to educate visitors that are not aware of the history here and just not aware of how to communicate when it comes around to racism. And I hope to, to, to at least mingle with these these groups that come in so that we can learn to have that talk and 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 I really choose to have some dialogue about it. Um, we have a lot of programs. I, I, I do hope that you did mention that we have apartments upstairs that the tenants upstairs will be involved in what happens here. I, I try to make them aware of what's happening here before they move here because I really don't want anybody being uncomfortable living above what's going on in the interpretive center. Um, we are also partnering with People's Institute to engage on the undoing racism workshops and that I kind of like want to extend everyone that's involved here to go through that workshop. And hopefully that'll get things started in this community and people will understand what really happened here and why it happened. Ms. Etienne, Ms. Prevost, do you have anything that you'd like to add there? Yeah, I wanted to say also that uh, hopefully this will bring attention to the culture of the city and what New Orleans, how important New Orleans was to the civil rights movement. There are lots of things that happened leading up to 1960 that happened in New Orleans. And hopefully that will bring attention also to the city and the importance, like I said, the importance that we dealt with in the, in the civil rights movement. Yeah. And Ms. Etienne, did you have anything else you wanted to add? About the building? I'm um, I'm just glad, grateful that Leona had that vision to have this project with the building. I'm glad that it's completed. And I hope the people in the Ninth Ward, Louisiana, United States, all over the world, have a chance to come down in and see the work that has been done and can learn a lot about the experience that we had there. All right, and so I want to turn to those experiences and talk to you about um, that day, November the 14th of 1960. Uh, first off, what do you remember about that day? What I remember is um, just preparing 
for school. Just, just a regular day preparing for school. My grandmother prayed morning, noon, and night. And that morning, she had a special prayer. I have I had no idea what you know what she what she was thinking, but she prayed for the teachers. She prayed for the students. She prayed for us that we would have a, a peaceful day. And I, I had no idea what she was talking about because I mean, we say prayers every morning, but it was never that intense, you know, to where the school was involved or whatever. And uh, just remembering the the uh, marshals come in, my daddy and I, my daddy and I left and uh, we got in the, in the marshal's car. And when we got to school, he told me, he said, give me your hand, look straight ahead and I'm here. And we got out the car and there was this mob you know, people see a crowd, but that was a mob that was out there waiting for us and had no idea what we were going, what we were facing that day. No idea what we were gonna face that day. And we marched up the stairs with the marshals and um, got in school and they didn't know what to do with us. You know, just we sat down on the bench outside the principal's office. And we sat there, like Leona said, we sat there, it seemed like forever. And uh, when we were finally brought to a classroom, there were a class full of children, all white children. But by the end of the day, it was just the three of us. You know, they were just taking kids out of the out of the classroom. And it was like that for the rest of the year and a half year of the next year. And we just it was it was just it seemed like it was just normal to us. And um, the teachers were there was still there, but the children were gone. There weren't, there weren't any kids in the school at all, but the three of us. And, I remember uh, something. Hmm? I was just gonna say that my remembrance of that day, I don't know for what reason, I've seemed to block all of that out. I don't really remember anything before we got to the school. I remember riding in the car and pulling up in front of the school and seeing the mobs of people. Um, I remember seeing the garbage can, garbage can tops, sticks and whatever the, the crowd was had in their hands. And they were hollering and calling, calling us names, I assume. I don't know what they were saying. To me, it looked like if they could get to us, they'd kill us. They were looking just that angry. It was just a large <laughs> crowd of people, mob, that was acting, really acting crazy to a six-year-old making all these noises and screaming and having things in their hand that if they can get to us, they would hurt us. I remember walking up the stairs. I also remember sitting in that stairwell, not the stairwell, and I guess the vestibule part of the school where we sat out there for a long time, waiting until they decided what to do with us. And as Leona said, we just played. And that was our first time that we really can say that the three of us got together and that I can recall. And from that system, that bond that we have today. All right, that's all right. Well, my family didn't talk to talk around me much about it. I knew I was going to a new school and I was happy to go to a new school. I had seen the building and it was a three-story building, whereas the school that I came from was a one-story building. So as a child, I thought I was going to a big school, but I was excited to go to a different school because I was uncomfortable at my, my old school. So that morning, um, before the marshals arrived, we had family and friends there helping my mother prepare me. You would have thought it was a holiday. 
but the black car pulled up in front of the door and then everybody got quiet. So I was like, something's about to happen. And I remember my mother saying, when you get in that car, you sit to the back of that seat and do not put your face to the window. And um, once we arrived at the building, we came in from the rear. And when we turned on St. Claude Avenue, there was a mob of people out there, you know, and I, I don't know if I was just not looking out of the window, like she said, but I, I, I didn't recognize that they were, they were being mean or they were being, I just heard a noise as if he was at a parade and I knew a parade passed on that street. And that's what I really thought they were out there. And I thought the police on horseback were holding the crowd back so that the car we were in wouldn't get them. And I think I even questioned my mom about it, why we had to go to school and they got to watch, you know, everybody else got to watch the parade. And she said that wasn't, that wasn't the case, you know. So we did get to enter the building and, and it was a calm um, site on the, that side of the street because the crowd couldn't get to the side where we were on. So we did enter. But once we got in there, it was a long wait before they even accepted us. You know. Speaking of acceptance, do you happen to remember anything about your, your teachers that first year since it was the three of you with the teachers? Do you remember anything about those first teachers? We only interacted with our teacher, who was Miss Myers, and she was a very, very, she was good to us. She was more motherly, I can say, than she was a teacher. Grandmother, like a yeah. grandmother. <laughs> yeah, because she was elderly. <laughs> she was and the elderly. I, <laughs> and um, I just can't remember really how she looked. I know she was small, a small, frail lady, and but she was elderly, and uh, I wish... I could even meet our family today to, to even say thank you. But we didn't interact with any other teacher in the building. Now, they were in their class because they were ordered to come to school and not have a job. But we didn't interact with anybody else. We didn't do anything. Didn't even realize how confined we were because we couldn't roam the building. We didn't eat in the cafeteria. We had to bring our food and beverages. We couldn't play in a yard. We couldn't see out the windows. They were papered up. And, but we were comfortable. You know, we were fine. We had one another. That's what so we knew. Yeah. It was just the three of us. And, and we, we were prepared. To, and, we, and that's the way we were prepared. We knew we had to stick together. We knew that. Leading up to that day, did you, did it, had anybody told you that what you were doing was, was going to be historic or important or or told you that that about what was happening? I don't think they realized how historic it was gonna be. You know, I really think we realized that I thought it was just gonna be a local issue. Um, I think we, my family probably realized that it went nationwide is when family members from other states were calling saying that they had seen us on TV. And I, and I think that's when they realized that this was something big, you know, it was really big. I didn't really realize what was happening or how big it was going to be. But after the process happened, years later and I talked to my dad and we had gone through some things that a six year old shouldn't go through. My daddy told me that um, if he had it to do again, he would even if he knew the things in advance that he didn't know then, he said that he would do it again so that I can get a better education. We were passing up um, schools that had better books, all the pages to go to substandard buildings that didn't have the proper things that we needed. So if the choice was to be made again, he would do it all over again, in spite of what I went through. Mm -hmm. Were any of you ever afraid or, or nervous about what was happening around you? I was afraid when I was in that car. Didn't I look like I was afraid? <laughs> I, was, I, didn't know, I didn't know what was happening. I saw the crowds of people. I know you saw them big eyes looking at those people. And it got to me. You know, I was afraid. But once I got into school and I got with Leon and Tessie and we had our teacher, I wasn't afraid at all because it was just the four of us, the three teachers, I mean, the three of us and our teacher, you know, and that's what we had every day, you know. So once I got in the building, we were safe. At least I felt safe. 
and the marshals were still there, but we didn't know it because we never saw them. They brought us to school and they were there when it was time for us to go home, but in between the time, we didn't see them at all. Thought they had left, but I felt safe in the school at McDonough 19. Yeah, I don't think I was afraid. Um, and I think I wasn't afraid because my family didn't talk around me to say anything to make me afraid, but um, I, I, don't, I don't know. It was just, it was, I don't know. I was just happy to go to a new school and just, just to get away from the crowd was just a new thing for me. And then, and then to get a ride to school for somewhere that I had been walking 10 or 11 blocks to get there was a luxury, you know, and I kind of happy in the marshal. If they didn't want to do it, they did it. We were well protected. Yeah. Uh, we had guidelines to follow that they prepared us with before then. We knew we couldn't exit a door without being received by a marshal. You know, never could we go on the side of a classroom with a window that, that was totally out. The windows were papered up. No one could see us and we couldn't see out. But We did everything together. We, we did everything. What's something that, that all of us, myself and the, the people listening, what can we learn from your experience? I, I like to say something on that. I, um, I want them to learn the truth, the whole story that on November 14, 1960, there was four little black girls that integrated two schools in New Orleans, one in the Upper Night Ward, and one in the Little Night Ward. And that was a part of history. You can change the story, but you can't change history. It's always gonna be the same. And just, I just want everybody to know that the three of us are three members of the New Orleans Four because it was four of us. And that's what we were called, the, the New Orleans Four. They call us the McDonald Three because we went to McDonald, but we are three members of the New Orleans Four. And that desegregation happened on that day in two separate schools. One and the reason it was two separate schools is because schools were by districts. Yes. So we had to attend the school that was in our district. And we lived in the district of McDonald's. Walking distance, walking right. distance to the school. With, it, which was in our neighborhood, you know. Yeah. So. That's what I want everybody to know, the truth, the whole truth. All right, one last question before we open it up for questions from, um, from the audience itself. But um, how can you take your experiences today? Excuse me. And, and, and bless you, how, how can we take today the experiences that you had and translate that into how we live today? I know we've got the Tate Etienne Prevost Center, but how can we take those lessons and move those into today? I just got to keep talking, share it with children. Um, my, my thing is for them to come and just walk the, the walk that we walked. You you know, and, and hopefully our exhibits here will give them the feeling of what we did and what we went through during that time. Um, and there was a lot of sacrifice. I can, I can explain it to anyone. You know, a lot of people, you know, they'll ask you questions, you know, and then when you tell them what happened, then you'll kind of feel what happened. But if you don't really see some of the videos of, of that time, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. I think people need to know that it wasn't an easy, an easy excuse me, thing that we did. It was tough. We were six years old. We were little girls, you know, and for the go to some of the things that we did, it wasn't normal for a six year old. It wasn't an easy um, step for us to do what we did, but we stuck together and we, we did it. We survived. And that's what everybody needs to know. And they also need to take advantage of all the opportunities, all the doors that were open because of what happened right. in 1960 yeah. by the New Orleans Four. Well, I, it looks like we've got a, a couple of questions. Uh, so the first question is, um, were you chosen to desegregate the school or did your families volunteer um, to have you desegregate the school? 
We were chosen. And there was an application that was placed in the newspaper for children in the black children in the ninth ward. Um, we were psychologically tested at five years old. And I, I think 140 applications of or a little, it may have been a little bit more than that, um, that were that were turned in. They only accepted five, but only four families participated. And it should have been, um, it was another little girl that should have been at France with Ruby and uh, she wasn't accepted because she didn't have a dad in the household. How did that experience shape the rest of your lives um, as you move forward in your lives? Didn't talk about it for years. I think we were more we overwhelmed. Talk about it when we were together, you know? Yeah, together we did. Yeah, that's the only time people, some people didn't want to hear about it. You know, they no, didn't want to hear about it. it. They, they just didn't, they didn't understand. understand. And we did the same thing. We were trying to explain to them that, no, it was different. It was different as to what we did back then. You know, and when you say that to some people, well, you know, they didn't want to hear the story. They didn't want to hear what we, all that we went through. So when we got together, the three of us, we'd always talk about it. You know, I enjoy talking about it with Leona and Tessie, but a lot of the other people just didn't want to hear about it. I um, didn't talk about it for a long time. Didn't even tell my children. They were almost teenagers when they realized what I had gone through. If you, knowing that you didn't talk about it for a long time, What's the difference now to, to make you want to talk about it and get this important story out in front of all of us? By visiting different schools and seeing the need of them knowing where they come from or, 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 or the history of the, the territory that they're walking on, you know, being from New Orleans. I can go out of state and talk to a school and they know all about me. And right here in New Orleans, they know nothing. I experienced that today. And... Uh, just, it's easier now for me, I guess, because I've, I've been talking a lot. And before it was so overwhelming, like Gail said, if one of us start crying, all of us would start crying. So, but uh, I think the more we talk about it and the more we get it out there, it, it needs to be told. It needs to be told. And it's getting easier. It might not seem like it because I'm always crying, but it's getting easier. And I enjoy being with Tess and Leon when we do it, so. People need to know. They need to know the process that happened so that they can attend the school that they attend today. I have the have the education that they have today because that wasn't available for all people, for minorities, blacks back then. There was a lot of sacrifices that was made. You know, our parents, them, they're the one that were important. They're the one made the decisions to let us go through what we went through. You know, so. They need to know that. They need to I tell children today that obedience played a big part of what we had to yes. do because we had to we had to listen. Yes. We really, we really had to listen. Oh, it My dad used to tell me, people watching you, you know, mm -hmm. be careful about what you do. Someone is always watching you. Mm -hmm. And he, he said that all the way till, till high school, you know, mm -hmm. me in 12th grade, 11th grade. And people watch, they still watch you, Dad? Yeah. They're watching you, and, all, waiting for y'all to mess up. And he yeah. said that because we, Integration progressed as we progressed the grade. And once we got to 10th grade, then it was opened up all the way through 12th grade. But um, that's the way it was. You mentioned that there was, there was pressure um, from people watching you. Um, what was that experience like? Overwhelming. The box. Why so? Overwhelming. Because it wasn't a normal thing for a child. You know, I mean, I had gotten to the point where if you brought it up, I'd just bust out and start crying because I just didn't want to, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to ask a question. It was always a lot of questions and it was always, it was just a lot more outside of school than in school. It was just an emotional time. Yeah. I know for me it was. And even now, sometimes it's, it's hard and it gets emotional, but 
I'm willing to go through with it and, and, and tell the story and get it out there because it's something that needs to be done. People need to know, like you want to say it. You right there in New Orleans, it happened in New Orleans and the people in New Orleans, except for the, the older crowd, the older people who have gone on to glory, other than that, the people there now, and they act like we talking about something that happened in another country. You know, they don't know. Some people even say, we thought y'all were dead. <laughs> and, we, and we still here. You know, so the story needs to be told. Yeah, story needs to be told. The whole story needs to be told. Another question that, that's coming up is, it asks, is there a documentary on, um, on your experiences? And if not, is there interest in creating one? Several, yeah. Yeah. several, yeah. yeah. We're in the process now of a documentary is supposed to be made. Be made. So um, when that's completed, I'm sure the information will be out there so everyone can see. You've been working on it, so that's the next step. Try to finish this document as it is being created. Um, Jay, this is there's a question that is that came up in the chat. Uh, someone wanted to know um, if they had integrated at different levels other than um, elementary school. Yeah, I, I saw that. I answered that one. We did. We integrated all each level until we reached 10th grade and it was open up to everyone. Um, if you were in 10th or, or, or higher, you couldn't go to school, to a white school until it was opened up for 11th and 12th grade. And that's what happened. Okay. And, and I see a, a question. Um, as, as you talk about your experiences, are you experiencing any, any blowback from the conversation surrounding critical race theory now? I think it should be in the schools. It definitely needs to be in the schools. It doesn't have to have a certain or uh, its own its own subject, but I believe that civil rights or, or black history is a part of every subject. But the problem is it's not always a pretty picture. Right. And that's part of the reason why they don't want it in the schools. But we lived it. And that's a part of history, what we went through. Like I say, you could change the story, but you sure enough can't change history. That's just fact. What you say, Tessie? I said that's a fact. That is. You can't, you can't change history. You know? and they're trying to change history. They're trying to change the truth. And I know my sister girl, Leona, feel the same way. Can't change that history. Oh, definitely, um, definitely. We were a part I, of it. We no. were a part of it. But they see the glory, but they don't know the story. They don't know the story. And it, it's not always pretty. No. That's part of no. the problem. Shut up. Would you say, Leona? <laughs> so they see the glory now, but they don't see they don't know the story. You know? No, they don't know the story. And I, that's I think why we have I'm Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying that's why we're here today, so that the story can get out there. And I think we've got one time for one last question. Um, and that was, were you, did you ever have the opportunity to be in class with any white students or, or were they always removed as you moved through the different grades? Oh, well, we got the Sims. <laughs> it was a different, it was a different ball game. I mean, yeah, we were in school with white kids, but we didn't have the marshals or the police protection there either. So we, it was horrific at Sims. You know, we totally really, different. really faced integration at Sims is really where we faced it. And, I don't wish that on nobody's child. Sam was a completely different experience than we had at McDonald's 19. Yeah, you're going to see some tears. Keep asking about Sims, and you'll see a lot of tears. <laughs> I'm trying not to. You're trying not to. You don't want to go there. Yeah. But that's a different story. It is a different, it's not a pleasant one. That's probably why they don't want it in the books. They don't want to hear about that story. That's a whole nother ballgame. Okay. Yep. Yeah. But y'all, you remember when we went to Baton Rouge to the Capitol? Yeah. Yes. That spoke. And there was a, a representative. It's a senator. 
He was a senator from Covington. Louisiana. I didn't know if he was from here. Hmm? He was from St. Bernard. I thought he should say Covington. Anyway, he came in and he asked to shake our hand because he said that he was one of the kids that were out, that was at Sims and who harassed us and just gave us hell. <laughs> he prayed with us that day, didn't he? Yeah. He yeah. wanted up, you know, he wanted to apologize. He said, I just want to pray with you all, you know, and say I'm sorry. Because Sims was as close to hell as I can think of as a child. You know, I also realized um, after going through this that. A lot of that was taught to the kids. All, all the kids, all the mm -hmm. white kids didn't want to, they didn't want to be ugly with us or, or, or call us names or not touch us. Because I mean, I had one to touch my hand or, or touch part of my skin accidentally. And they said, you know, that their mom and dad told them if they touched me, that they were going to turn black. And that's what they, they were taught that a lot of the kids, some of them got it in it, in it you know, naturally, but there were some that, that were just taught that, mm -hmm. you know, and today I have some friends, I live in Oklahoma, and they say they don't understand how I don't hate all white people. And that's what I tell them. What we went through with those kids, a lot of them were taught that. They didn't know any better. They were just doing what their parents told them to do. Like I say, some naturally, but some were just told that. And I have several yeah. white friends in Oklahoma. You know, we, so, don't, we weren't raised like that. So we, you know we, weren't. we weren't. We weren't raised that way. You know, you we know, had we to realize that. We know to go to school and hate somebody just because their skin was a different color. We didn't. We knew nothing about that. No, nope. you know? it's not the way we were raised. Well, I see we're getting close to the seven o'clock hour, so I do want to offer my thanks to all three of you for coming and telling us your story, but also for um, for for the things that you did to open things up for me. I. I don't know that I would have been able to do the things I've done in my life if not for exceptional people like you that opened those doors for me. Um, when you didn't even know who I was, didn't even know that I would exist. So I wanna express my gratitude to all of you for, for doing what you did so that I can could walk this path myself. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you um, so much um, to, to Jay and to our amazing panelists. Um, I want you guys to keep the discussion going on our forum, Connect. This is our online community for people in the, in the business of saving places. We have active conversations happening all week around topics from section 106 to women's history at historic sites. If you, if you haven't joined Connect yet, you should. It's a great place to keep up this conversation and start more. Please join us for these upcoming Preservation Leadership Forum webinars. And thank you to everyone who attended today's webinar. Um, a special thank you to our speakers for sharing your amazing, um, moving, incredible stories um, with us. Um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions um, following this webinar, um, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, our email is forum at savingplaces.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.